So please turn in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 21. Now, we're going to study a, a topic today that I have actually preached on two other occasions in the past 23 years. So you don't get this very often. And just a little bit of a, a spoiler alert, the last two times I preached on this topic, people got mad and left the church. So you're actually, you're, you're, I'm showing you how much I think you've grown and matured and we're going to be okay to talk about the seven joys of giving. The seven joys of giving. I don't want to call it the seven responsibilities of you better give because it's actually more blessed to give than to receive. It is a joy to know that your giving does something good in this world, something for which you are called to do, to have a purpose in your heart, a, a meaning. It, it does take money to run a ministry. Ministry is actually just Jesus' work continuing in the world. That's what ministry is. So you and I are continuing Jesus' work. That involves evangelizing the world, with the gospel, how expensive is it to send missionaries? And it also involves running a, a community, you know, a, a, not a building, although buildings come with expenses and we have a building for convenience sake. We don't do house to house church like they used to do. God has blessed us with a building, but buildings have expenses. We had the lawn mode finally, and it's expensive. And we are needing to continue Jesus' work. But just imagine a church that doesn't mow its lawn gets to be kind of irritating to its neighbors. And so we want to have a good reputation, be good neighbors. But we also have people in our church with needs. And we love and care about our people. We don't, we don't say, give us all your money and we'll distribute it accordingly like they did in the early church. But we believe the Holy Spirit does guide us to give more, a give a psalm, and the more we give, the more faithful giving we, we display, the more God returns on us a blessing. So we're going to talk about the joys of giving. There's actually at least seven very joyful reasons to give to the Lord. Father, thank you so much for your love, and thank you that we can study this topic some churches may do it more often, a couple times a year. We do it once every 10 years or so. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak to the hearts of the people because it's so important that we get back from you the, the, the blessings of being like you. It is more blessed to give than to receive, and you are a giver. You gave us your son. You gave us salvation. You gave us the Holy Spirit. You gave us your word. You gave us your promises. You give us yourself. We want to be givers. We don't want to be takers, but givers. We want to join with Jesus in what he's doing in giving this world light of salvation. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right, so our first text is Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. The first joy of giving comes from this verse. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. So this is the temple treasury. Now, it was a, a, a tax in the Old Testament times. You bring a tenth of what your income is, what your, your grain and that you grow in your field and what, how God blesses you, you give a tenth. Why is a tenth kind of important? Well, if you think about it, if you have 10 people or 10 breadwinners, 10 families living in some small town and they become a church together, by contributing a tenth, they can actually have a hire some, a teacher to, to support them with the teaching and he's going to live at the same level as the people. So giving them a tenth is great. Uh, and that was the Old Testament tax. That is not a principle in the New Testament. There's no such requirement of a tenth. As we'll get into it, you'll see that sometimes giving more than a tenth is, is what God is calling you to do. 
Sometimes you're so destitute, you need to receive help from the church, and you can't give. We're a family, we come together. We're going to try to reflect the principle of living together, pooling our funds and making everybody livable. There's a lot of individuals that have been blessed, and there are some that need to, sh- to share in the blessing. So we, f- we figure out how to help our people. We do it differently than the early church, but the principle is the same. All of our members matter, and some of them are more needy than others, and everyone has something to give. So he also saw a poor widow. Widows in that culture were very vulnerable. It was a very male-dominated culture, and the men were the breadwinners, and when one of them dies, the widow, hopefully there's male uh, children, their sons, that can care for their mom. Not always the case. This was a poor widow. And he saw her put in two small copper coins. Two pennies was all she put in. He saw the, the large donations of the rich, and then he saw a widow with two small coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they, all out of their surplus, put into the offering. They had extra. They had money they didn't need. Now she had two pennies that she needed. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. First joy of giving. It's not how much you put in the offering. Did you hear that? It's not how much you put in the offering. It's how valuable the gift is. And that's determined by how little you leave in your wallet. Think about that. It's not how much you put in the offering. It's how little you leave in the wallet. God God is a sacrificial giver. Jesus laid down his life as a sacrifice. It hurt. Jesus went through intense pain to pay the price of our sins. Giving is meant to hurt a little. It's meant to be sacrificial. How many of you moms, we did Mother's Day last week, and that was so nice seeing you uh, encouraged, but how many of you moms have actually gone without sleep, gone without something you've wanted because your kids are in need? I don't see any hands up. I think every mom should have their hands up. You love your kid, you give to your kid, and it's a sacrificial thing. You can't just live high on your own hog and say, oh yeah, kids, go take care of yourself. They need help. Giving sometimes hurts. God counts your faith in giving, not by how big your gift is. You might not have much to give, but God can see your faithful giving as more valuable than the the money bags billionaire who puts in 10%. If you have a billion dollars and you put in 10%, how much is that? A hundred million. Which leaves 900 million for you to live on. Do you think you can live okay with 900 million dollars? Pretty much. So the person that has a billion, God gave them his money to that billionaire to be a steward of it. You think maybe God would want more than a hundred billion from that giver? If a billionaire gives a hundred billion and you're poor and you give till it hurts, God is more impressed with that gift and he can stretch it farther. It's not how much you put in the offering, it's how much you're willing to suffer, diminish your lifestyle to free up money to help those around you that have greater needs. The next joy of giving comes from the next couple of verses. And while some were talking about the temple, now this was Herod's temple. It had gone through a multi-decade renovation. It was the most glorious building in the ancient world. It was written about saying that if you have not been to Jerusalem, you have not seen a beautiful city. If you have not seen the temple of the Jews, you have not seen a beautiful building. And it was a lavish, spectacular building 
that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts. What are votive gifts? Votive gifts are actually a bribe to the gods. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? They each, these two brothers each gave a gift. Abel came and he brought forth his firstlings and the fat thereof, Genesis 4. And God looked on his gift with favor and he was pleased. Cain thought, ooh, I'm going to get this blessing from God too. And he brought some, some, and he gave the, the produce of his work labor to the Lord, but it was only some. He didn't give his best. He gave expecting a blessing back. Abel gave from the heart because he loved God and he gave him his very best. Abel gave out of gratitude. Abel gave out of a, a liberty of being able to be useful to God. Of course, as the story goes on, Cain was pretty upset that he didn't get the same kind of blessing when he figured he deserved it because he gave. And he ended up hating his brother and killing him. First murder ever to take place in human history. As for these things which you are looking at, all these votive gifts, these bribes to God, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. The most beautiful building in the world is going to be rubble within your lifetime, Jesus was telling them. And it did. It happened in, in 70 AD. The Romans came in and destroyed it, the place. What about those votive gifts now? Well, you can't take it with you, can you? Your money... You might have a nest egg. You might comfortably live on your nest egg. But you, that nest egg is not going to be able to go with you into the afterlife. You can't take it with you. So give your very best. Give it from the heart with no strings attached. So if you want to tithe, that's a tenth. It's a good number, but... It may not be, it's not a New Testament principle, but let's say you've determined you're going to give a tenth. And so you write out your check and you give a tenth. When you just give that to the church, the church as a community decides how to spend it. You as the rich person who puts in the bigger gift don't get more than one vote. You get one vote at a business meeting, no matter how much you give or little you give, because you're a member of the family. No strings attached. You give because you love God. God will bless you for it. So it's a joy to be able to give from the heart. A blessing to know that your gift is used by God to do something great in this world. Now, great doesn't always mean what the world thinks of as great. Right? The world's all about money, popularity, power, you know, the world's got its values. What we have is love and usefulness to God. Those are great things to have. You can have a small church and be mighty in faith. You have a large church with everybody smiling, everybody wearing nice suits, and nothing really God-pleasing happens. It's really about the heart. You give from the heart because you love God. The next joy of giving comes from Matthew 19. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? So he was a Jew, and he came to the Lord. Uh, he, was, he was a faithful Jew, but his religion wasn't doing it for him. He knew he was missing something in life. What good thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, a reference to God. All of us are sinners. Jesus is not a sinner, but he didn't necessarily know that Jesus was God in the flesh. And so it was just kind of a, a reminder, you know, to notice who you're talking to here, right? 
But if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. Don't misinterpret that to say, in order to be saved, you must keep the commandments. It's not that you earn heaven by climbing up the ladder of the commandments. But if you really do want this new life, if you really are missing out, come, uh, join and merge your will and your life into what God is doing. Be pleased with what pleases him. If you want this new thing, your heart needs to change. That's what he's saying. The man said to him, all these things have I kept. What am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, now a mature believer, someone who is, I mean, we all have room to grow, right? No matter how long we've been in the Lord, no matter how wise we are and how much of the Bible we've read, we all have room to grow. But as we grow, we are becoming more mature. And hopefully by the time we're mature, we're not going to walk out on the pastor because he preaches about giving once every 10 years. Anyway, um, if you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. It's really all about following me. I have no place to lay my head, Jesus says. Right? And I go and I feed the thousands of people that come to me. I heal their diseases. Jesus is giving, loving, generous, gracious Savior. Follow me. Be that way. Put others first. Right? Be a blessing to others. Put them ahead of yourself. And you'll have reward in heaven. Your reward in heaven will be great. So it's a joy to be allowed to serve God in blessing someone else. Now, if you say, well, that's just not fair. I should be about my own blessing. I deserve to be blessed too. You know what that's called? That's one of the commandments that Jesus didn't mention, or that, that, that uh, yeah, that Jesus didn't mention to the rich young ruler. That's coveting. Are you excited and happy that someone else is blessed? Do you weep with those who weep and Rejoice with those who rejoice? Well, if you can lift someone with a sh with, by sharing with them, by giving to them, by putting others first, that is a God-like thing you're doing. That is really the blessing. And it's a joy to see someone who has been struggling that you care about do much better because you, the help you're able to give them. So number four comes from Acts chapter two. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. That's pretty amazing if you think about it. Those are people that see themselves as a family, right? And your family... Parents are responsible to teach the kids there's limits and, and you have to do chores to get your allowance, you know, and all that kind of stuff that you just learn about life comes from your parents, right? But the parents don't really think of their kids as burdens, right? And the, the spouses share together. There's no such thing as my money and that person's money. It's a family. And so the early church had those family feelings by their bond in the spirit not necessarily blood right the spirit the spirit they, they say that the blood is thicker than water which means you got your family's back but actually the spirit is thicker than blood and so this is how they did it out of love and convenience they had the apostles right there that that oversaw the ministry of distributing food and if people lacked housing and clothing the community would take care of each other like a family so they had all things in common right but there was this guy who was a part of the community and wanted people to think of him as a generous sharer of things a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the piece of, of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. 
So what he was trying to gain from this is to look like everybody else. I'm a part. I care about my community. I'm, I'm sacrificing myself to be a blessing to the community. But yet, secretly, he kept back some of the money so that he could hedge his own bet. You know, he could, he could, he could keep it in his own nest egg in case of a rainy day or whatever, right? If a rainy day hits someone in the church, it should hit everyone in the church, honestly. It should be all hands on deck to help out this situation. Okay. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. So that laying at the apostles' feet is surrendering it to God's will. Here, God, I'm giving you this money, and the apostles represent Jesus, and they run the church, and they make sure everybody's needs are met. And so he gave some, like Cain did. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? You gave with strings attached. You didn't give because you cared about the church. You gave because you cared about your position in the church. There's something more important than you tending to yourself with your own money. And that is, what matters is ministry. What matters is Jesus' work in this world. That's, what's, that's what matters most. Jesus' work in this world is making sure that the family of God is cared for and the message of God is taken to the world. In a, in a very credible way, through love and through, through effort, sharing the gospel, sending missionaries. Jesus' work is more important than anything you might want to do with your little bit of excess. You get a raise, and most people, most immature Christians, woo-hoo, I got a raise, that means I'm going to get to do what I've wanted to do now for a while. Where the first thought didn't go is what really matters. And that's Jesus' work. Jesus' work in this world needs to be advanced. It's advanced by the faith of the people, and the people are servants within the kingdom, doing the kingdom, doing the king's work. That's way more important. If you can keep your lifestyle the same when you get a raise, it frees up more for you to be a blessing to others. And that's the joy. Why is it that you have con conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. Now, I don't think that that's, we should take that as, ooh, if I don't give more, God will strike me dead. That's certainly not the point here. The point is, what matters? What priority do you place on church? Attending church so that you can be a part of the growing community and know what's going on in each other's lives and be that loving member that greets one another and learn together and celebrate together. That's way more important than a lot of things we spend money on. It just is. And, and Ananias was trying to get all the credit for putting the priorities right but they were wrong. And God used him to encourage us to, to prioritize the big stuff for our, our giving. And the, big, the biggest thing of all is Jesus' work. So here's a passage from 1 Timothy. The elders, that's another of the biblical words for pastors or teachers, the elders who rule well are considered worthy of double honor. So that doesn't mean you pay them twice the average income of the church, but that's what they're worthy of. Their job is so important, they, they deserve that much. Of course, they're willing to do it for less. As a, as a generous church that loves and prioritizes, they try to pay their pastor well. Keep him out of a part-time job so he can be more devoted to the church. He's worthy of double honor. And then he goes on, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. 
Because the authority is not vested in the man. The authority is vested in the word. God's word is the authority for the church. The man is responsible to deliver the word in meaningful ways. And if he works hard at that, giving you the accurate interpretation and giving you the the proper emphasis and encouragement and understanding of the scriptures so that you can do the job of the church, because it's not the pastor that does the job of the church, it's the people that do the job of the church. You want to be able to do it in a way that relies upon what God really is saying in his word, and so you hire a teacher to help you understand that. Especially, though, in our church, we set it up, I think, wisely. I'm on every committee and board without a vote. I don't get a vote. I don't get a vote in any of the church decisions. I don't make any decisions for the church. We have boards that are over certain aspects of the church, like the grounds, the lawn mowing and snow plowing, and, and then the fellowship events like the, the mothers and daughters banquet and, and the, the Sunday school department. All of that stuff is done by y'all. You do it. And you listen to me so that you can do it according to what the Bible teaches. And those are the ministers who are doing the worthy job that deserves double the average salary. We can't afford it. I'm okay with that. I just say it because it's in the Bible. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So set godly priorities. Ministry matters, right? And give where it matters the most. Number six. We have brought nothing into the world so we cannot take anything out of it either. So long as we have food and covering with these, we shall be... Oh, I'm sorry, this is number five. Uh, With these, we shall be content. So we don't need a lot to be happy. Money is kind of an evil thing, or at least the love of money is. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men to ruin and destruction. For the love of money, you could call that greed, covetousness, You could call it materialism. For the love of money, that's a whole attitude of life. Materialistic attitude of life is the root of all sorts of evil. Most of the evil things that happen in this world happen because people want enough money. They asked Howard Hughes how much, because he was a billionaire, right? One of the first billionaires in our country. How much is enough? You know what he said? Just a little bit more. He was a slave to becoming more rich. And he was already the richest man in the country. Just a little bit more. It's not enough to have my billions. I need a little bit more. The love of money has plunged men to all kinds of ruin. And, And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So money is only money. It's not really valuable. What is valuable? Well, there's stuff money can buy that are necessities, but are they really valuable? Money is only money. It can't buy what God gives away for free. Think about that. Money cannot buy what God will give you for free. God will give you joy. God will give you love and peace eternity with him god will give you this stuff for free and it doesn't really matter how rich you are that's the wrong race to be in the rat race is the wrong race don't be a part of the rat race but money can take away your joy just a little bit more before i'm happy well god will give you the joy you just trust him Seek first his kingdom and righteousness. All these things he will will give to you. Number six. 
It's from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So the metaphor of, of throwing out seed to grow, the more seed you throw out, the more your harvest will be. Money, the more you give away, the greater will be your wealth in real terms. Not necessarily money, that's the wrong race. But to be the kind of person that is worthy of respect. To be the kind of person that, that people look to and depend on and are blessed to know. That kind of person. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one, now this is, this is the, the key point. Each one must do, must is a responsibility. We have a responsibility to give to God. Must do just as he has purposed in his heart. Where did he purpose to give? Did he announce it before him? Did he say, blow the horn, I'm putting a big offering into the plate. Toot his own horn about it. Bible says, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You have a purpose in your heart. I'm going to give you this much this week, God. I do this when I write out my tithe check. I think, okay, God, this is, this is my portion I purpose to give you. And this little bit here that I, is extra, I'm going to add in. And each week I figure out to the penny what can I do to maximize my giving. And that's a purpose in my heart that I do. I don't tell y'all what it is. I don't hear from y'all what you give. It's not my business. It's not each other's business, how much who gives what. Actually, in our church, it's really, by, by bylaws, one person to know if somebody gives by check so that they can get a tax-exempt uh, you know, a, a receipt of the giving uh, to take advantage of the tax exemption. You could also give with just cash, and no one would know. Um, if you want the tax exemption, you're welcome to it, but one person has to know. That information is not publicized. I don't know, unless you give in PayPal, because then it comes to my email that someone gave. But other than that, and most people don't give in PayPal, maybe 50 bucks a month or whatever. But, but uh, it is a responsibility. One must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves it when you decide you love him enough to give him a bit more. And so I just challenge you, if you want a bigger blessing from God, give more. And if you go to the max and give what you can reasonably give, right? You don't want you to give to the point where you're going to lose your home or have to run around with, with uh, no clothes or whatever. Uh, but reason it out in your mind and figure out how much you love God and talk to God about the amount you give and give it. Each person must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So guess what? Giving is a personal matter. It's nobody's business, right? What you do with God's money is no one's business but yours, dot, 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 and God's. You, you step it up a little bit, God will, if that's a faithful offer and you're just doing it with no strings attached, God will take note and he will up your blessing. He will bless you according to your faith. One guy in uh, the church where I pastored before in South Dakota, he said, someone asked him, do we tithe on the net or do we tithe on the gross? And he just looked at him and he said, well, do you want to be blessed on the net or do you want to be blessed on the gross? <laughs> I thought that was pretty, pretty good. <laughs> I might steal that someday. <laughs> uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 12. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. No matter how much you give, you cannot outgive God. God is the, the God who will bless you for your faithful giving. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread to, to, for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing 
and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll grow spiritually if you give. Remember, it's not how much you put in the plate or the, the offering, it's how much you leave out, or, or it's how much, how little you leave in your wallet that God notes. You'll be enriched in everything for all liberality with uh, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. So these are, he's, Paul's writing to people who have supported him in his ministry. Wouldn't it feel good to relieve a brother or sister's burden? If you have the ability to do that and you do something kind for them, doesn't it make you feel good? You've been useful. You've been helpful. God remembers that stuff. This is probably my favorite passage of all. This is written to the Philippians who had given Paul a gigantic love gift. So Paul was in prison in Rome, and he had to be in the dungeon because they had to watch him. But Philippi, the church in Philippi, heard about it, and they sent Epaphroditus with a love gift to Paul that enabled him to rent a room in an apartment and pay overtime pay for the guards to watch him so he could be under house arrest and that way continue doing ministry for two years. That's how the book of Acts ends. For two years, while Paul was waiting for trial, he was able to live in that apartment because of this gift. And Paul writes this, not that I seek the gift itself. Paul's not saying, I need a, a 13th jet in my fleet of, of ministry jets, so I only have 12 jets to do my ministry. I need a 13th one. So little old ladies who are on fixed incomes, just whatever you got in the bank, send it in. That way I can have my jet. Paul is just saying, I just don't want to be in the dungeon because I can't minister to people. And so they gave him enough for two years to rent an apartment and pay for the guards. And Paul still says, it's not about me. I am not in it for me. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. What's he talking about? Your treasure in heaven. God sees your faithful giving, and God is storing up for you a glorious treasure in the afterlife. If you have faith to believe that, great. If you don't and you decide, eh, I kind of want to get rich or kind of want to keep my nest egg, I want, to, I want to breathe easy with a nice, big, fat bank account, so I'm not going to do it. Well, that's a decision you're entitled to, as a free American to do. But guess where it's not going to go? It's not going to go into your treasure in heaven. People of faith do believe in this treasure in heaven. Jesus preached on it more than once. You will have treasure in heaven. Don't store up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves don't break in or steal. Greatest preacher of all time, Jesus. But I have received everything in full. I have an abundance. I am amply supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, that sweet savor in, in the nostrils of God when you give to him out of love. A fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice. It smiles, it, it, it pleases him, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You cannot outgive God. No matter how much you give, you will never be able to pay back God for what he's given to you. You cannot outgive God. The more you give, the more he's on the hook. He puts himself on the hook to give. He says, test me now in this. If I will not open the floodgates of heaven for you and pour out a gift you cannot contain. He says that in Malachi in the Old Testament about the tithe. But the principle applies today. Now when you're deciding your amount to give, 
A tenth is a good place to start. Some of you can't quite do that, and that's fully understandable. And some of you can do way more than that. I can't tell you a number because there's no number in the New Testament to say do it. But I will tell you, you can give more than you're giving. That widow gave two copper coins and her gifts were bigger than all of the rich people putting in their bribes to God. It is more blessed to give than to receive, Acts 20, 35. Let's review, right? Seven joys of giving. Give till it hurts. Just a little bit more each, each, each time you decide to up your giving. How much more can you cut out of your lifestyle to give more to God? Give till it hurts. Give from the heart. Don't give to get something in return. Give because you love God. Put others first. That's love, by the way. Putting yourself first is not love. And we're told that the world will know that we're Christ's disciples if we love one another. Put each other first. Put others first. Um, and then remember, Jesus' work matters most. Make sure you're giving there. Some people say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to this cause over here. I'm going to give to that cause. And this guy on the TV, he needs some money. I'm going to send some there. But where does it matter the most? Where it matters the most is right here. So that we can have a ministry that the world can see is a loving ministry changed from this wicked and perverse generation by a wonderful Holy Spirit that has given, been given to us as a free gift. That free gift is for anybody who wants it. But they're not going to want it if they don't see that it works. So be loving. Give here. Give here. It's where it matters most. It's your church family. You give here, you help each other. You give here, you help the cause of Christ from this little corner of this embassy, because we're ambassadors for Christ. This property is an embassy, foreign soil, this heavenly soil here. Give here. Five, it's only money. What good is money? Necessary evil, perhaps, sure. You gotta you gotta. Manage your money wisely as good stewards. God gives you your money. He wants you to live comfortably. He wants you to have a roof over your head, clothes on your back, food in your, in your cupboard. He wants that for you. And you, you're entitled to that. From whatever income you have, you're entitled to take care of those necessities first. God doesn't want you to give that up in order to fund him. But of everything beyond the bare necessities... The first is God. It's only money. Why not give it where it matters most? Give it to God. Number six, it's between you and the Lord. I am not going to pay any attention to anything that's going on in the books. I don't want to know. And for all I know, someone could have given a big gift and I wouldn't know who it is. I want to just treat everybody like they gave that big gift. And finally, you can trust God's generosity. He's proven it. Right? You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. You've been bought with Jesus' blood. You belong to him. You're his servant. Now, he sets you free if you choose not to serve him with your time, by being involved in the ministries of the church or with your talents, helping the church function better or your treasure that he gave you in the first place. He's, he's going to love you no matter what. Love him back by being a faithful giver. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful love. Thank you that you are the God you are. And you have devised this wise, glorious gift of salvation. And you did it in such a way that you get all the credit and you are so worthy as a generous, loving God. And we are so needy and we accept the gift. Help us to go free, not have any hang-ups about who's richer or who's poor. Just love one another. 
be willing to share. When we're freed up to be able to have a gift, to be able to give to you, Lord, give us joy in the giving and make us fruitful as a church. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. How much of it did Jesus pay, by the way? He paid it all.